ki- theater makes you gay, but you know in the old-timey sense of the word, then you're in luck, because this week we're watching 2014 Stage Fright. Adam was hoping the whole camp would fall victim. Matt's sad to see his fedora-sporting brethren die. And Scott's happy that Meatloaf's mustache made it all the way to the end. <laughs> Strap in, because we're about to talk about Stage Fright on Horror Movie Night. So we talked about Stage Fright in two- from 2014. Uh, this was picked by Scott's wife, Megan who uh, will be on a future uh, episode of this podcast. Uh, she kind of picked it because Scott told her to pick it, because he was like, hey, it's horror in a musical, so you might like it. No, Scott... no, stop. No, <laughs> both you shut the fuck up for about it. one minute. Let me explain. <laughs> okay. Because it always sounds like I'm the puppet master behind the scenes, and it's not true. So yeah, you're... you're... You're flexing your superpower where you fucking force people to watch what you want in this club. <laughs> the way it really happened was I was scrolling through Netflix with Megan and we were like, what can we watch? This was maybe six months ago. And um, I saw the 2014 version of Stage Fright. I said, hey, honey, pretty sure this one is a uh, is is like, you know, a musical kind of horror movie, but it's probably not super – Super scary, so you know you'd probably like it. And she's like, "Okay, cool, put on your cue." So she did. So we did. Never touched it because, like I've said in the past, we don't watch a whole lot of horror movies together. I mostly do it on my own, and she'll look over and be like, "What the fuck are you watching?" And then oh, a couple weeks ago, she's like, "I want to pick a movie." And I said, "Okay, pick a movie." She said, "Oh, I have no idea." And I said, "Well, you know, you could pick Stage Fright. It's on our Netflix queue. And we could just watch it real quick, and then you could talk about it." And she's like, "Okay." That's how it happened. Gotcha. That was the extent gotcha. of me, you know, behind the scenes getting someone to, to pick a movie that I wanted to watch, which is not necessarily true. I had no preconceived notion going into seeing this version of, of Stage Fright. And as far as I can tell, I'm not positive, but I think two of us like this movie and one of us viciously hated this movie. And Adam long- hates everything. Yeah, I was going to say, long-time listeners will will immediately know who probably was the person who hated this movie. Not even long-time <laughs> listeners. If you listen to one other episode, you know Adam <laughs> hates everything. It's like, oh, was this movie delightful and fun? Well, then Adam must have certainly hated it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, there's times where like I, I actually kind of like the movies, but it'll be 45 <laughs> minutes of like, God fucking damn it! What, a, what the fuck? Is, and then at the end, I'll be like, yeah, but it was okay. It was all right. I, I That's kind of like the horns episode when I was like re-listening to it. I'm like, you hated it so much, and then at the end, you're like, but you know, I'd maybe watch it again sometime. <laughs> so, so this movie begins uh, with the final number of a musical, which has my favorite part in the entire movie is like right in the beginning when is it Meatloaf that's talking to the kids or is it someone else? Who's just talking about their mother, and he's like, her voice, it's so fierce. I'm enchanted. <laughs> no, that, was, that, was, that was just the gay uh, stage director. Yeah. Which I guess carries over to the camp, too. I guess you can't be, like, a stage director without being super gay. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to offend any listeners, but I did, I did musicals when I was in high school, and the, the, the gay dudes are always the best at it. So I'm not surprised. Yeah, no, that that's pretty much my experience in high school, too. So, you know, and that's why I was so good at uh, musical plays. Um, I, I, th- <laughs> I also think that you and me doing musicals yeah, when in what is technically the age range of the campers, more or less, or what it's supposed to be, even though they have a 28-year-old playing an 18-year-old, is that I think that you and I could be, like, fondly getting the jokes, and Adam's just like, God, these nerds suck. Yeah. Well, I think it's the same reason why, uh, depending on if you did theater in high school, depends on if you think the movie Get Over It is one of the better or one of the worst teen flicks, because it's just nothing but inside jokes about having to do stage plays in high school. Oh, is that the one with, with Martin Short and he's yeah. like, put us on your front butt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love how that's like the thing I remember most of that movie. Uh, yeah, that movie is actually pretty spot on and fun. <laughs> Uh, so after this this performance, the the so enchanting lead of the play is going backstage, and we meet her two twins, a uh, boy and a girl. They're supposed to be twins. I think I told so. Them it's that part. I because they, they, they are, refer to they them are as the 100%, twins. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, they refer to them as the twins at one point. Okay. So while the mother's getting ready to go uh, meet someone, the little girl goes and starts dancing on the stage, and as that's happening, her mother is murdered. And that Which first is a kill, brutal, yeah. brutal kill, dude. That shit that is, was fucking brutal as all hell. 
that's that's why I was so confused when I was watching this. I was like, "There's no fucking way Megan picked this." I was like, "What?" <laughs> she has like, no why? idea. That was like the first five minutes. She knew yeah, that there I was, was like, meatloaf and Mini Driver in it, and she was sold. <laughs> she know that Mini Driver swallows a fucking knife in the first uh, five. Minutes? <laughs> Adam, I, she didn't swallow it. <laughs> so I didn't know going into this what it was like. I knew of the first stage fright. From the 80s. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't know anything about this either, but I expected it to be a remake of 1987 Stage Fright. And boy, was I wrong in the best possible way. 1987 Stage Fright is pretty bad. Well, I didn't even know that it was a musical. Like, I had no clue what this was about. And I'm like, halfway through the movie, I'm like, wait a second. Is this a musical that takes place at a musical camp? (laughs) Like, this is awesome. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So we jump 10 years into the future. And the twins now work in the kitchen at the musical camp, and the director is um, a, not a, a Joel. No, who is a what? What the hell's Meatloaf's character's name? Buddy, right? Uh, who cares? Roger. Meatloaf. Roger. Yeah, 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 fuck yeah, it, Meatloaf. <laughs> so Meatloaf uh, runs this camp, and he was the manager for their mom. So he uh, gives them a job working in the kitchen because thanks a thanks a bunch, Meatloaf. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't really. <laughs> Great, great dad. Right there. <laughs> like, uh, and then, like, the the worst part about that is, like, you know, like, from being a, like, a, a pseudo, f- like, father figure to these two twins, that at the very least, uh, Camila, I think is her name, uh, like- wants, wants to be an actress. Like, so why would you just be like, well, I'm never, ever going to let you actually be a part of any of these plays, but you can feed the kids that do get to do the things that you want to do. Um, but she sneaks into an audition for the play, and that's where she befriends Joel. Who, red herring number one. Red herring number one. Who? Uh, I, I, this movie has oh no red God. herrings. No, this is yeah, the most red telegram- herrings out the ass in this movie. Like fifteen red herrings, <laughs> which is pointless because I figured out who the killer was seven minutes into the yeah, fucking then, movie. Yeah. <laughs> like almost immediately, I'm like, oh, it's probably that guy. And then, like every single piece of. Of, like, whenever someone would get killed and then they would cut to the Phantom or, or whatever you want to f- refer to the character as, I was just like, oh, yeah, no, it's definitely that guy. <laughs> like, like, the more it happened, the more I'm like, uh-huh, yeah, no, hates hates all the musical kids, makes sense to me. So, so what, two two quick things. Um, that intro, the, the, the kids song at the, the beginning of the camp. Yeah. Oh, my God. I thought that was hilarious. But I could just I, – I think that half of my laughter while watching that scene was knowing Adam was in hell. <laughs> Man, it was so brutal. Like they went this Les Miserables-like route where they would make the songs tell the story. But it was like sing-talking for tw- – every song was 12 minutes long. Yeah, no, the songs are long. The songs were shit. a little long, but <laughs> that song really worked in my opinion. I thought that song was great. I think that was the best – I mean as far as like exposition songs in musicals, that is the right way to do it. And well, I, Matt Matt's, Matt knows. I was going to say, I would also think, as far as I recall, and, and obviously there's like a few exceptions, but in general, most of the musicals that I, that I, think, that I can think of, the opening song is usually really fucking long because it has to set everything in motion and introduce so many characters in that opening song. Like, like I feel like if you were to look at most musical soundtracks – you would find that like the first and last song are usually the really fucking long ones because <laughs> they're building Maybe. all the characters and or wrapping up the whole story. Well, here's the thing that they do wrong. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, I guess that the thing that they do wrong with that, that introduction song is that they don't really set up any of the campers' personalities. They set up the little kids. They set up the little lot. kids and state that one character's gay. Like that is all that that yeah, song well, actually achieves. Yeah, but there's no like if if um, Hannah B. Yeah, I, her I, character's I name is Liz. Liz. Okay. Liz. So they should have set up Liz as being like they should have focused on her more. You know, in the in the cuts, and they should have focused on her being like kind of the the girl who always gets the lead roles. You know, um, they they didn't really do a very good job. I feel like they should have spent more time with her and less time with Camilla because, like, I get what – I think that everybody gets her motivations. I, you don't need more pictures – you don't need more um, scenes of her, like, kind of half pouting into the camera. Yeah. They could have used more to, ex, to like, do exposition for – 
for the reason why Liz would want to 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 do like the the paint onto um onto Camilla during the show to to carry her. But uh, anyway, yeah, I, they could have done a better job on it. But um, I still think that it was fun. It, it still, I, I think that this movie is like. 70% of what it could be like if they would have gone and gotten at least 10 maybe 20% closer to being like a really great send up of like theater kids stuff I feel like they got a little lazy with that but if they would have gotten a little bit closer to it we would be just raving and I think a lot more people would be raving about how this is such a good movie and how it like the jokes are great I just feel like they had the, the structure there but I don't know if they really had a writing team that was able to get there, you know? Yeah. This is definitely a movie that I've recommended to a few people, but the few people are all people that I know did, like, musical theater in high school. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. like I wouldn't just recommend it to the average horror fan because it is – Like Adam. <laughs> yeah, like Adam who suffered through this. Anyway, so the fact that uh, – you know, you know what really hurt my enjoyment of this movie – is that like two days previously? I had watched Phantom of the Paradise again. Oh, just and, set uh, that precedent. That's their fault, though. <laughs> I know. I had to show it to somebody. They'd never seen it before, so I was like, "Oh fuck, yeah, let's do that." And then <laughs> I thought we were watching 1987 Stage Fright, so I was like, "Whatever, some dude in an owl mask running around killing people. It doesn't fucking matter." But and we got this with all these fucking child actors. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, oh, I love when you have to watch child actors. So, so her <laughs> I brother. Hate it. So, I know. So Camille's brother Buddy is upset that she is even auditioning for the play, let alone getting into the play. And this is where we also meet the director Artie, who keeps saying that he'll give the role to her so long as she sleeps with him, and she continually refuses. I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but Meatloaf, uh, the camp uh, with Meatloaf, but the camp is also on the verge of bankruptcy. That's the thing that keeps coming up. So after Carmilla refuses to sleep with Artie, the night, after Caramello, the candy bar, <laughs> yeah, whatever, uh, she refuses to sleep with Artie the night before the play. He's murdered, and literally every murder in this is fucking delightfully brutal. Like those yeah. are the big appeal of the movie to me <laughs> well that's that's what's so funny is that uh, you know we, we live in a we live in a a time where like a where the genre in general is kind of like okay well let's be as brutal and, and offensive as possible and and i usually get turned off by that where it's like let's have these kills be incredibly torturous you know like the saw movies people loved the saw movies because they were just incredibly awful deaths um and I feel like this, but in the 80s, people would be like, oh, what's the, you know, movies like The Prowler, say, yeah. um, they would they would be like, okay, it's, it's you go to watch the kills, not the story, um, which I felt like this kind of was like that, well, where it's like the, the, the kills are really, really good, but I also wasn't, they were like slasher kills instead of torture kills, which I appreciated. They were trauma kills. They They were so... Out of the realm of possibilities, that right, right. Oh, yeah. that it was but, like oh. that it was like comedic, and it was like, oh, let's see how brutal this can be because we know that it is going to be nowhere near a realistic way that a human being is going to be murdered. Yeah, like, there's nothing fuck, wrong with that. Truly. Yeah, like fucking the light bulb thing. <laughs> oh, that was great. Oh my god, that was awesome. Uh, yeah, I loved every kill in this movie. That one in particular was pretty crazy because it went on for a while. Like he kept doing stuff to that guy. And I'm like, oh, just end it. Fuck, holy <laughs> shit. Like, I, know, I know this guy's been a real piece of shit, but man, even he doesn't deserve this shit. This is fucking brutal. Holy shit. Uh, so, Roger, after after Artie's death, uh, which they claim was accidental, uh, taking a page from my favorite slasher film, Sleepaway Camp, Roger makes Camilla the star of the show, regard, uh, which makes the uh, character of Liz Val Revenge. Um, and that's where Scott was referring to the whole like I'm gonna carry her type moment with the paint. Yeah, yeah. Can I can I just say some when when they find the the director guy and he's dead. Somebody goes. Uh, somebody goes. She goes like uh, Camilla comes running up. She's like, "What happened?" They're like, "Oh man, can't, uh, bunk number eight found what's his face in pieces on the stage this morning." And then later on, like they're doing the play, and we were like, "Well, what 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 happened to that body? Like who cleaned that up?" And I was like, "I guess." I guess the people from Bunk Number Eight had to. I mean, they found it. It's their mess. They gotta fucking clean it yep, up. I that's, guess. that's camp camp rules. Um, 
Now, I never went to sleepaway summer camp, but that sounds a little untrue. <laughs> I don't know. I've never went to that shit. My parents loved me and wanted to keep me around during the summer. So yeah, sure you were like, Mom, Dad, can we watch Space Invaders again? <laughs> Get this kid the fuck out of here, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so slowly cast members are killed as the production goes on. Eventually, oh. Buddy is revealed as the killer, which is like the least shocking reveal. But at least he had a good reason. Yeah. Which because... I feel like this, this movie in general really gets the whole... It, it it hits a lot of the things about '80s slashers that other movies that are trying to cop the or homage the style don't get. Like they just they don't get that the killer is always going to have that exposition scene where he explains why he kills people and and it's it you know like then there's going to be like gory kills but without being torture kills because he's not getting like pleasure out of seeing people in pain he's getting pleasure out of or like you know he, his his desire is to see people dead not like writhing around which is at least that's the way i take like slasher killers yeah that makes sense but one thing that i totally forgot while you were burning through the storyline of this movie um the there's there's a mean girls joke um when she when liz is talking to the uh other singers and, she, and she's like she doesn't even go here I was like, that's a straight girl's quote. And then she's and and then she's like, why am I even talking to you? You're an alto. Or that's like, such I, a great line. I that, love that fucking line. That is the second best joke in the movie. The first best joke is something about like, um, I got beat up for quoting Sondheim musicals or something like that. And that's like in that intro song. No, it, it definitely has, like you said, a lot of great insider uh was that phrase inside baseball or whatever you can call it for for uh, theater geeks? Um, so the reason why Buddy kills is because Meatloaf killed their mother in a jealous rage, uh, which it's like okay, that was like the one thing where I'm like, all right, well, how are they going to tie this to the the murder of the mother? Because I'm pretty sure Buddy's the killer, but I also don't think that Buddy <laughs> killed their killed mom. <laughs> like, um, so Roger tra- ends up killing Buddy. In it, and then attempts to kill Camila, and then Joel kills him with a table saw. Joel doesn't, does he? I thought that Camilla well, was holding they it. Bo- they they saw both her. kill him together, kind yeah. of. Like, she's trying to use the saw on him, realizes it isn't plugged in, and Meatloaf is like, ha-ha, I'm going to kill you now. And then you look over, and Joel's right there, and he, like, boop, plugs it in, and she oh, fucking okay, yeah, table yeah, saws yeah. the shit. I guess, that, I guess that does count as yeah. Joel. They, 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 they had teamwork. They were they worked together as a team. And, yeah, and it was, then it was, Joel it was, doesn't it was, even get the girl. Yeah. Uh, Camilla ends up... Take fo- that stage hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Camille ends up following in her mother's footsteps, but is still haunted by the fear fear of the ghost killer. Very I really liked that they didn't have another killer at the end. Yeah. Like, they had the jump scare with the killer coming through the, the glass, but then it's like, everybody to the stage, and it's like, yep, she lived through it, and she has to go, like, uh, just live with the, the, the horror and the guilt. I yeah, thought it was great. She's gonna relive this traumatic experience every fucking night for... Who knows how long? Yeah, and that's that jump scare. Yeah, it is pretty. It is a pretty dark ending. I I was kind of hoping Joel would come in and like get like hug her from behind, like how it happened in the beginning. Hey, did anybody else totally discount Meatloaf as the killer? Because you're like, oh no, I saw that killer in the beginning. He was way skinnier than Meatloaf. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the most accurately that... named singer of all time. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, that jump scare at the end fucking got me real bad. Man, it got me bad. <laughs> Yeah, man. I I was expecting something to come from behind her, and when it popped out through the mirror, I was like, oh, (laughs) jeez! Now that just solidifies my desire to really watch horror movies with you in the same room. That being said, though, I want to, like, I know that Adam didn't like this movie, but there are, like, I have to say, like, there's a lot of things that I I liked about it, and one of the biggest things I liked about it was that um, it does remind me of like the musical episodes of Todd and the Book of Pure Evil, and yeah, not just Todd, because of Hannah B, uh, but like the yeah. music in general. Oh, and also having the killer be like a heavy metal singer. Yeah, I I thought that it was a bit ridiculous when when he the first time you see him do his 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 song, which is the "Shut Your Fucking Face" song, which I I, I don't know, I didn't particularly care for that, but I was like, exp- I was truly expecting it to go into like a deathcore number like where he just he would scream instead of sing 
but he was doing the falsetto stuff, which makes sense in the in the concept or in the the scope of of it being an actual musical and and uh, everything. But uh, then he does like the knife capo into the guitar. Uh, and the, the, I was just about to say, if we forget to talk about the guitar the solo, cape. Jesus Christ! <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, it was. Oh man, that was so good. And then when Meatloaf is is killing Buddy, stabbing like synchronized stabbing with the song. That was great too, because I, I I don't know I feel like there are glimmers of absolute genius. I mean, maybe not absolute genius, but you know, like when they really get it, yeah. what they should have done. But they just I don't know if they didn't have the people or the just the drive to get to 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 making this movie what it could have been. And that's really more than anything what disappoints me about this film is it's it's got some really great scenes and it's got some really great jokes and it, and it pays homage correctly, but it just doesn't hit. The tone as often as it needs to to be really like uh oh my god I have to tell people about this movie and and the the best thing that I can say about this movie is that it's not Repo the Genetic Opera. Which, oh my god! Like, yes, absolutely, because that movie squandered its potential. And I know that we talked about that in Horror Club, and I don't remember who it was, but they were just filleting that shit. And I was like, it's really not good. No, it's, it's not. Re- really not. Good. And when and it's I got. Anthony Stewart head, and it's got um, Paris Hilton. Well, <laughs> that, Bill Mosley, actually skilled, Im- infamous singer Bill Mosley. <laughs> <laughs> He's a triple threat. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, like when I told people, like, "Oh, you got to see this. It's a horror movie and it's a musical," and they were like, "It's it's not like Repo, right?" And I'm like, "No, no, it's not like Repo." I, can... I love how that's people know about Repo because it's shitty. Yeah, well, I think there's the people who fucking love Repo and they're like 17 year olds, and yes. then and then there's any other person who's ever watched and enjoyed any musical in history, and they're like, you know. <laughs> No one's going like, you know what I really want from my musical? None of the songs to be catchy. Like, I want to not walk away remembering a single song. That's that's my goal when I watch a musical. Um, <laughs> and I, I want to be, like, really, really unhappy that I'm watching this musical every moment of the, uh, every moment of the film. That's exactly how I feel about Repo. Yeah, fuck that movie. So, what did you guys watch this week? I actually rewatched. For like the 18th time, uh, that 20 minute short documentary, uh, American Juggalo. About, <laughs> I watched that about um, once a year, too. <laughs> yeah, I was not even kidding. I get I was like, I'm in the midst of showing somebody a bunch of stuff, um, Phantom included. And then we were talking about Juggalos and cracking jokes, and I was like, oh man, you got to see this. So I, we watched that again, and I fucking love that thing so much. <laughs> it almost, it's almost so endearing. That it kind of makes me want to go and get fucked up at the gathering. Like for a half a second, I was like, "This this looks like kind of fun." And then and then that one dude comes on the screen and he's like, "I want to get laid, man." And he's got a little sign around his neck that says he's a 21 year old virgin. And they're like, "Well, you might get laid." And he's like, "No, not knowing me." And they're like, "Why not?" And he's like, "Cause I like to fucking stab people." And they're like, "Oh shit, that completely broke my illusion of the gathering. I don't want to go there anymore. Fuck that." I, uh, I, it was like years ago. But when that doc first came out, I had the director on the pot, on the Saint Mort show, and he was like, oh, nice. he was like, dude, he's like, I love going to the gathering. He's like, I hate everything about the music, but I go and I just talk to these weirdos for like a day and a half, and then I'm like, all right, time to go home. I've had enough of the gathering. You know, and that makes total sense that he it really isn't making fun of them. It's a it's it's what a documentary is supposed to be. It's yeah. just letting people talk. Yeah. It, it because that how oh, it's a perfect personification of the trash that goes to the gathering. As I've said in the past, the gathering happens about maybe 7 or 8 miles from my house. It is the fucking scab of uh, <laughs> America. Um but everybody the- that comes sucks. I I there it is like the worst thing. But the, it, my favorite part in that documentary though is that there's like a ton of people who are exactly what you would imagine a juggalo to be. And then and there's like, them are normal, yeah. and then there's like a bunch of them. They're like, Oh no, I'm a doctor, but I come out here like once a year. Cause it's like a thing. And you know, all hell, the dark carnival. Woot, woot, and like, <laughs> <laughs> <he's> like, yeah. <laughs> you, know, I, you guys might think that I like, that I don't get it. <laughs> I, that, that I don't understand the attraction of, of juggalo culture, but 
I grew up in northeastern Ohio. As you can understand, it is kind of a hotbed of juggalos. Yeah. Uh, they have the fucking gathering here. Whoop, whoop, whoop <laughs> is used in regular conversation by normal <laughs> professional people. It has become a part of our social consciousness in northeastern Ohio. That's how deeply ingrained that garbage culture is. So when I say that I hate ICP and and Juggalo culture, now you understand. Yes. But I do think that 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 um, documentary does a great job of humanizing and endearing the humanizing them and endearing you to the people because they're just normal people. But they also have very poor social skills and and like yeah. Well, just walking around like, I want to fuck. No, wait. I want to sing you a rap about stabbing you while having sex with you. That's socially acceptable. Is that all you watched this week, uh, Adam? Yeah. I'll, yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so so uh, this week, I, I'm only going to talk about one movie that I watched. I barely watched it. It was not good. Uh, a movie called Easy Rider 2. The Ride Back. The Ride Back? Why would you do that? What the fuck? Uh, Because, as you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts that review movies, and I refuse to listen to the episodes until I've seen the movie that they're reviewing. And I'm pretty sure every single one of the podcasts I listen to is done Easy Rider 2. So I was like, all right, I sit through this 80-minute piece of garbage, but I get the enjoyment of three hours of podcasts that I enjoy. So it felt like a fair trade. But, uh... Holy shit is that movie garbage. Like I just started reading a book midway through the movie. I'm like, I I don't need to keep watching this. <laughs> it is just fun. and I the worst part is that I'm watching it and it's like I hate Easy Rider. Like I I think it's one of the most overrated like classics. And I was like, I I don't even care that this is an insult to the original movie because I don't even care about the original movie. I just think it's a fucking piece of garbage. It's a fucking terrible movie. And like one podcast tried to compare it to like on the same level as the the room in Birdemic and uh absolutely not because those movies at least have some type of like so bad it's good entertainment value to it, but this is just like boring and terrible. Like the worst combination. It's like if you if you took that first 5 minutes of Birdemic where it's just driving it's just a car driving, but then yeah. expanded it to 80 minutes. It'd be, <laughs> it'd be that on par with how entertaining <laughs> Easy Rider 2 to the right fucking back is. It's, it's really fucking bad. It is it is pure, unadulterated garbage. Uh, so that's all I got to say there. Scott, how about you? What did you watch this week? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I can follow up those two wonderful discussions. Um <laughs> I just was re-watching Captain America the First Avenger because I am so hyped for Civil War to come out in, uh, well, probably it'll be the week that this comes out, actually. So, um, yeah, I am just so, so stoked. Um, Captain America is my favorite of all the superheroes in movies right now. Um, Chris Evans is just the perfect person to be that character. And And if you would have told me, Future Scott, like in 2009 or whatever, when the first Avenger came out, that uh, Captain America would become my favorite superhero, I would have slapped your face. Like, I would not have believed you. But man, Chris Evans just kills it. So good. Um, and, and he's basically like an analog for Superman, too, because Superman is awful. I, I didn't watch Batman versus Superman, but um, yeah, I, I, they just cannot get Superman right. And uh, and so Captain America it is. So anyway, that's I I do appreciate that we're getting Batman versus Superman, and then like two months later getting Captain America Civil War, which is essentially just the Marvel version of Batman versus Superman. No, except Batman versus Superman should have never happened. Like yeah. I understand that the whole point of that movie is is a is a charade, and actually Civil War is a real fight. That That's what I mean. One, but in do the you, comics and two. But do you think that, like, I, I mean, I would be pretty, 
I, I would put money down that DC was like, oh, Marvel's doing uh, a, a Civil War thing where Iron Man and Captain America are going to fight? Uh, shit. Okay, uh, Batman and, and, and Superman, they're going to fight too. Let's, let's get yeah, back out. Yeah, just so we can have the Justice League. It's like, <laughs> yeah. doing, it's like doing the Avengers in reverse. Uh, <laughs> Either of you saw Batman versus Superman then? Not yet. I, I do want to see it when it comes out on DVD because I'm, I'm told it. that like it's worth watching just for Ben Affleck's Batman, Affleck, which is yeah. apparently great. But Megan won't watch it because Batman is her su- favorite superhero, and she's like, "No one can be better than than uh, than Christian Bale's Batman." Christian Bale. I nope, was like, disagree. Maybe give ben Affleck a a a chance because he's now he's our Batman now, and she was like, "I I can't talk to you when you're like this." <laughs> uh, I, I know that I know that Megan's going to get really upset, but uh, Chris, but Christian Bale's like my third or fourth favorite Batman. Yeah, like, yeah. You're probably a Michael Keaton Batman well, fan. Well, here's the thing. I think, that, I think that Christian Bale is a great Bruce Wayne. Not, yes, he is a great Bruce Wayne. I'm not sold on his Batman, whereas Michael Keaton, I think, is a garbage Bruce Wayne, but a pretty solid okay. Batman. And I've had that argument with so many friends because all of my friends are obsessed with the fucking 90s, even like you, but like they don't get the point of Batman, and so at least you get the point of Batman that he's supposed to be suave. Yeah, he's supposed to not be a bumbling jackass with, <laughs> with people, and then good at fighting crime. But they've also never done a good Batman where he's an actual detective. Uh, never, um, never once. Uh, I believe you're forgetting Adam. the '60s Batman with Adam West. No, <laughs> I am bringing the '60s Batman. The, the, the '60s Batman. Guy. Is the Batman who does the most detective work. I'm just saying. <laughs> it might be shit detective work, but he fucking does detective also work. Also has shark repellent. Yeah, he does those detective skills of being like, hey, that attack happened at C, and C stands for Catwoman. <laughs> 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 All right, that was Stage Right from 2014. As always, you can send us some suggestions of movies that you would like us to review. Just shoot those emails at hmnpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can also go on iTunes and rate and review us, subscribe to the podcast, or subscribe to our uh, SoundCloud account. And also join on the Facebook group. Search us out. We've got a pretty active group with people chatting about important things like, is Final Destination the greatest horror movie franchise? Uh, thank you, Adam, I for finding like- that pile <laughs> of garbage. That was <laughs> not much of that? a discussion. No, it's just a bunch no of no's. <laughs> yeah, because they're forgetting Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, like, Sleepaway Camp. There's no, there's no, and nobody even said, no, not, Sleepaway Camp is one good movie, one mediocre movie, and two bad movies. Come on, Matt. <laughs> uh, but no, like, why did nobody, I, I didn't get into it, but yeah. like, because I, I don't want to be Adam and I'll always yeah. be negative. Uh, but I was going to be like, none of you fuckers are going to say that right on street. Come on. No, I would actually say, and, and it's, this is a little bit easier since there's only three of them. But if I was going to say like the franchise or trilogy that I think is consistently the best, I'd say Ginger Snaps. Ginger Snaps 1 and 2 are both really fucking good, and Ginger Snaps 3 is pretty good. Whereas like any <laughs> other horror franchise, even like Nightmare on Elm Street, I fucking love Nightmare on Elm Street, but it is a chore. To get through Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The hey, Dream Child. What about Puppet Master? Yeah, Puppet Master should be the number one franchise. <laughs> uh, all right, so don't forget to send us some emails or let us know your thoughts. What is the best horror franchise? Send us your uh, your arguments and we'll we'll read it in a mailbag episode one day. HMNpodcast hey. at gmail.com. Wait, can I just do this? Can I say. Can I say, because we need these fucking reviews on iTunes. Whoever writes the funniest iTunes review, I will fucking read it on air for you. All right. That works, too. Yeah, let's do that. We'll look for the funniest reviews. And also emails at hmnpodcast.gmail.com. listening to the Geekscape Network.